Well, I actually, you know, we really hit off, we struck a nerve, I think, toward the end, right before lunch, I think we were heading into an area where all kinds of questions and issues were raised. And I'm just going to kind of name some of those, I think, topics or themes that I'd like you to kind of hopefully will germinate more in your minds as we move toward the open discussion session. You know, so, of course, this is called the Cultural Workforce Forum, but, you know, I think we're still, among ourselves, we're still kind of batting around what do we mean by that, and we haven't really given, on our side, we haven't given you a clear definition of what we mean, and I think we're still trying to understand what types of cultural workers, arts and cultural workers are we interested in knowing more about and for what purpose. But also, I think one key theme that, again, is going to come through, I think, in some of Van Marcus's work is the notion of hybridity, hybrid occupations, very difficult to get at that information. We know that there was a lot of, there were presentations about the Census Bureau data, and while it's provided an enormous perspective, great perspective on long-term trends, we are locked into, as it were, 11 categories or so that we've been studying for a long time now, and to some extent, then, those data are intractable. But I do think this session is going to point to some new opportunities, including, and I just looked at our colleague from the Census, because there's some, a new survey out that is, I think, going to capture different types of information or allow us to get a little deeper, perhaps, than what we're interested in, at least collect it more frequently. The other thing is we heard a lot about, we heard about novel kind of survey methods, and what was interesting is sort of the mix of quantitative and qualitative data we got kind of dramatically through the life map and the SNAP project, but also through other, some other discussions, and also the rapid deployment of surveys, you know, the link bid, for example, sort of, you know, they turned it around, I think, two months, and what are the unique strengths and weaknesses of all these various approaches? It's a lot to think about, so I probably should turn it over tactfully to Anne, and we'll hear from, about Anne's work in the top, the presentation title, I think, is Artists in the Greater Cultural Economy. Thank you. Some of our publications, just for everybody to get a look at them, one set in each direction. This first, GIA Rater, includes, by the way, Yasmin's wonderful study on artists of color in New York, so please take a look at that. Okay, these are the National Endowment for the Arts categories. I'll just say it's important to understand that designers are a part of their definition, but not some of the cultural industry workers that are part of other ones, and so this supplements some of the discussion we had this morning. These are the ones my project has used, one of the traditional, really, four artistic categories, visual artists, performing artists, musicians, and writers, and then a set of related cultural workers. This is also from Greg Wassel and Doug Minatale's work as well, and notice here that we also have media and communication workers in this set. The main point I'm going to make with this really short little first part is to say that it does matter a lot what we include in the category of artists, and it really affects the outcomes in different ways, just really. So I wanted to say just at the outset that one of the things I think we're all really being asked to do is get out of, out or beyond the nonprofit sector box, and one of the ways we can really do that is trying to understand the role of artists in cultural industries and in communities. I'm not going to say much about the community side today because my assignment was the cultural industries, but I think it's really a marvelous thing to use artists as a lens for understanding the breadth and complexity of art worlds and to explore cultural ecologies as well at the local level, whether urban or rural. Okay, so just note here that if you include these related cultural workers as just to make, again, the point that we made this morning, there are a lot more people in this related cultural worker category than artists, and especially the designers category is very large, and that makes a difference. One of the places where it makes a difference, I was reading the interesting piece on women artists that NEA did earlier this year, and I was really stunned for a moment when I looked at the map that said that Michigan had, that women artists in Michigan get paid very, you know, much lower rates or earnings are much lower than men's, and then I remembered, oh, it's industrial designers. Detroit, 
has, you know, nine times the number of industrial designers as, you know, the nation as a whole, and that very, very male occupation is all about the auto industry, and they're very highly paid. So, and that, again, I think is an argument for disaggregation to echo something that came up in the last session. Well, a couple of years ago at Grantmakers, Doug DiNatale, Brandy Cohen, and I realized we were having a little, you know, kind of a skirmish about who was an artist. So we decided to write a paper together with Greg Wassel in which we looked at different definitions and how much of the workforce in both the Boston Metro and the U.S. they accounted for. And you can see the range here is enormous. So Richard Flores' creative class, 48 percent of all people in the workforce in Boston are in the creative class, and 38 percent nationally. And then his super creative core, which includes scientists, engineers, artists, and so on, somewhat lower, but still very high. The cultural workforce definition, I believe this is the one that Greg and his colleagues use in their New England studies, about 4 percent. They include a lot of the related cultural workers, the people that are in the Howard Becker art world, who are helping artists make their work come to fruition. Our cultural workforce one, which I just showed you, the NEA one, a little over 2 percent of the workforce. Again, this is 2000 census data. And our, you know, really restricted one without the designers, less than 1 percent. So it makes a huge difference how we define artists. In our paper, which I really recommend because we also talk about the cultural industries and defining those, and we raise provocative questions like why isn't why aren't religious organizations considered to be part of the cultural industry since they employ about a third of all musicians in the United States? We argue that using nested definitions is a really important way to go so that we appreciate there's something that each of these definitions offers and to clarify at the outset which we're using and why and that we'd want to use different ones to solve different problems and for different constituencies. Um, okay, um, artists are embedded in art worlds, and I really recommend Howard Becker's wonderful book, which has been just reissued in the last year or two about that. Um, and we know that about 48 are self-employed. That's a higher number than you saw this morning, but it's from the BLS numbers and somewhat different definition of artists. Um, and, uh, but that also means that 52 percent work for employers, so 52 uh, percent of the artists responding to the 2000 um, sense that some for nonprofit employers, many for for profit employers, and some work in cultural industries, and some work in non cultural industries. And that's kind of my role to lay that out in a few minutes. And many work simultaneously in commercial, not for profit, and community arenas. These are the self employment figures from the BLS survey that we talked about this morning, where the CPS numbers are put together with the census numbers. 65% of writers in 2000. Um, were self-employed, 57 percent of visual artists, 36 percent performing artists, 41 um, percent of musicians, um, designers, lower architects, even lower. And that's a really distinguishing characteristic. So a lot of the problems we think about as artist problems are often more about artists as self-employed than artists who work for organizations. Also, just notice the second job figures here, again, to underscore that musicians particularly, one in three musicians and this counts people who are doing it as a second job, are doing it as a second job. So that's um, really interesting. One way to look at the intersection between cultural occupations and cultural industries is to start with an industry like advertising and look at the share of artists in its workforce. And here are the numbers from 2002 for um, the advertising industry. So uh, overall, you know, in the United States, uh, you know, this is less than 2 percent of the workforce in these occupations. But in, in advertising, about 10 percent are. And 5 percent, or five times the national average, are the core cultural workers, the four groups of workers. And you can see who they are. Graphic designers, art directors, writers, multimedia, artists and animators, self-designers, and so on and so forth. So a very important cultural industry. We can do this for any industry, by the way, publishing, performing arts, et cetera. In our artistic dividend study, which was the first one that we did in 2003, we argued that artists also make important contributions to non-cultural industries, and they're really under the radar. And um, as a way of kind of getting at that, last year in a paper that isn't published yet, we actually went and cranked from the census data again the intersection between artists and different groups of artists and the various industries. Now, unfortunately, there's this lumpy category called independent artists, performing artists, um, that, you know, accounts for about a third of all artists. Uh, 
But these are the other industries that are really important. This is a census category problem, by the way, which we should talk about at some point. So notice other professional scientific and technical service, huge employer of artists. Many of those are photographers who fall into that group, but many of them are other types of artists as well. And then radio, television, broadcasting, cable, huge employer of artists, motion picture industry, religious organizations. Here are the, look at the numbers of musicians and composers that work for religious organizations. Newspapers, colleges, toys, and so on. Even management, scientific, and technical consulting service, computer systems, design related. Artists make enormous contributions. It's a visual world. It's an oral world. And this is a part of our story that we're not telling very well. I would go through the different categories if I had time. Shifting gears a little bit. How do artists in their own work lives sequentially and simultaneously cross over between commercial nonprofit and community work? Again, following on some work that Greg Wassel and Neil Alpert did early on, or maybe it was Neil and his other colleague. We did this study for the California Foundations who wanted to really be able to demonstrate to the commercial sector how important nonprofit support of artists really are. And we used artists as a lens for doing this. We did in one of the first online, large online surveys of artists, because we didn't know what our universe was, we worked with hundreds of organizations to get the word out to artists to take our survey. We did benchmark our 2,300 responses. Note there are probably over 100,000 artists in the Bay and LA areas. So that's a very small rate of return. But we benchmarked it against the US Census. So we didn't claim that we made it, we weren't sampling. We didn't claim that we had a sample. But one thing we tried to do is see the extent to which our population looks like the national population. We did this for every socioeconomic variable in the census. We did have more visual artists than the census. We think there are reasons for that, because many visual artists don't do it as their major occupation. And we did also have many more women than men, which just turns out to be true of almost any survey that you give in the American population. And here you can see that one of the things we're really proud about, that we actually did have fewer white artists respond, proportionally, than some of the other groups, especially this incredibly growing group of multiracial. This was a 2006 survey. And of course, this is 2000 census data. But otherwise, we did really well with African American and particularly Asian Americans. We did only get about half a percent of Hispanics. The same thing for immigration. The point of that just is to say, if you're going to do these new online surveys and you can't use the techniques that Joan has been able to use, where she can really work through, knows what the population is, and can work through it in the snowballing technique, this is another way of doing it. The most important finding from our study, we thought, and an unexpected finding, is what artists said about this mix in their lives. You know, not unexpectedly, 51% of the artists worked more than 65% of their, or earned more than 65% of their income in the commercial sector. They only put in 39% of their hours in the commercial sector. So what's the point? They make more money in the commercial sector than they do in the nonprofit. But when we asked them, if money were not an issue, would you specialize in one of these sectors or another? How would you allocate their time? Surprisingly, all of them would mix their time more. More of them would work in the community sector. Those that were concentrated in nonprofit sector would work less time in it. Those concentrated in the commercial sector would work less in it. And in a series of qualitative questions, I don't really have time in my allocation to go through these, we asked which sectors were more important to them for different developmental attributes. And these were the answers that we got, by and large. Again, you can read this in our study at much greater elaboration and so on. And also, we have many interviews with artists whose own work lives really demonstrate this kind of crossover. How am I doing? OK, great. Terrific. The next major point I want to make is that artists really are embedded in places and spaces. And although this is really important to their ability to do their work, and I think distinctive compared to many other occupations, they do have discretionary choices because so many of them are self-employed. So many of them do choose to work and to change their workplaces very often in their lives. They're highly mobile between regions and between rural, urban, and big city locations. And just to give you some sense for this, 
These, again, are census numbers, which I'm really wondering if the American Community Survey is going to enable us to do what we've done in this, taking the responses of people from 95 to 2000 that are in the census and asking where they were as artists before and after artists, where they were in 95 and present. So here you see that in that period, Los Angeles gained two artists for every artist that left. And um, the deficit places down here are a really interesting mix, not just of you know, older industrial cities, but fast-growing places like San Jose, um, Houston, Texas, uh, and so on. And you get a kind of mix up here of other places that are both fast-growing, so they're just getting a lot of artists because they're fast-growing in general, and the Portlands, New York, San Francisco, San Diego, and some other places. So that's um, you know, how artists are moving between large metropolitan areas. This is a really interesting little um, bit that we did on Minnesota, and I would, am hoping really to get some NSF money to explore the whole um, phenomenon of artist migration. We asked here um, of the census data where artists were in Minnesota and how they moved um, for the Twin Cities area, which is this uh, maroon color, and greater Minnesota. So this is what happened in Minnesota. Huge out-migration rates of artists from age 16 to 34. They're going to school, they finish school, they're going to the big city for exposure, for networking, to meet mates, whatever they're doing. Um, but look at this, a really interesting reverse migration. So again, the Twin Cities gaining artists in this period of time from wherever, not necessarily Minnesota. Um, a loss um, of artists in the Twin Cities in that period of time, and a considerable gain by um, outstate places. Artists are mature, they're going back, we have lots of hypotheses about this, you know, to work in their hometowns where there's more space, it's more affordable, more community, wherever they can travel to perform or sell their artwork from there. And again, in the retirement period. So I use this as an argument for small towns not to worry about their artists leaving. They need to leave. They need to go have the experience. Concentrate on this mid-career group of artists that you might win back to your communities. Okay, the distribution of artists. We saw a little bit of this this morning. This is a little more, and this breaks it out by discipline also, again, from the census. Um, three times as many artists in Los Angeles as a share of the workforce than the nation as a whole. And up, uh, also New York and San Francisco, we call these the you know, art super, artist super cities. But an interesting group of second-tier cities in here that include Washington, Boston, Seattle, Minneapolis, St. Paul, San Diego, and Miami, with good representations of artists, considerably above the national average. And they vary by occupation. Performing artists are the most concentrated musicians, the least. Um, think again about that religious organization thing. And again, an interesting mix of cities that are below the national average in that concentration. We can also break this out, as we did in our paper that Greg and I and, and Doug and Randy did, for different metropolitan areas and just see map artists by occupation onto industries and show some big differences. So for instance, um, you know, 3% of um, visual artists in the U.S. work in motion pictures, but 20% do in L.A. And uh, lots of uh, visual artists in the specialized design services in Boston, lots of artists in Chicago, three times the national rate in advertising, and so on and so forth. If you can go down this table, I probably don't have time to go through it. But again, really big differences. Publishing very big in Boston for writers, advertising big in Chicago, and so on and so forth. Um, and we have this, this is why the census pump data set is so fabulous for us. It's a 5% sample of the whole population. I guess, you know, in 2012, we'll have five years of the American Community Survey. Again, I'd love to talk a little bit about that this afternoon, how this kind of analysis will change with the American Community Service. Okay, two minutes. Okay, um, I just have pictures left. So this is how you can map data. Again, census data, this is for Los Angeles, and it shows one, the density of artists, so the dark stain. I loved that my GIS person just chose these desert col colors for LA. So of course, darkest here. And then also just showing the distribution of artists by the four basic disciplines for the LA basin. So out here in the more Latino and working class white areas of uh, uh, LA, you have the uh, musicians and visual artists, and to some extent writers. Most areas writers are also spread out more, but there's a lot of script writers here. And lots more musicians in the African American part of LA and so on and so forth. And these numbers have been very wonderful for artists to see themselves map. I'm sorry these <laughs> map fonts don't work out. But So the last thing I want to raise is um, 
is a challenge to us as researchers. Why not, why don't we use art more to tell our story about artists? And particularly, why don't we use photography more in art communication and research? I don't have time to talk about this, each of these photos, or even who they are, but I want you to notice the following things. I'm trying in my photography that I'm using in my studies to show artists at work, not just in a portrait, or not just the work, but artists at work, in a space or setting, and with audiences, if possible. So this is uh, at the Japanese American Cultural Center in LA, Hiro Kosaka, their artistic director. Just notice, there are other musicians there, there are people in the background that are part of, obviously, the event that's going on in this beautiful space in LA. This is Marcy McIntyre, an Ojibwa um, native artist in farther northern Minnesota, and this is her working at her bead working room and in her gallery, in which she sells not only her work, but the work of many other artists on her reservation. This is Marcus Shelby, a jazz musician. This is Mark, oh, oh, the lights. Could we have the lights turned down by any chance just for these? This is just, oh, such a beautiful photo. Um, anyway, this is just a picture of jazz musicians at work. And. Oh, well, the camera can't take a picture of the photo then. <laughs> Oh, well, all right. We don't need the camera. I don't want the photos to actually be on the thing. So. <laughs> Thank you. Because they, they're proprietary. They belong to other people. It's a question of intellectual property rights. So anyway, uh, but anyway, musicians at work, but again, not with their audience and hard to tell where they are. This is Marcus Shelby's um, cafe that he has in San Francisco with his artist partner. You can see the two of them down here. They have space for rehearsals for um, jazz musicians and visual artists working spaces, and I could tell you a lot more about how they use the space. This is a picture from the Playwrights Center in Minneapolis, and it shows that you can show even playwrights the socialization of the art worlds around them. The Playwrights Center hires artists to read works of playwrights before audiences and get feedback, and this wonderful sign here says, thank you for creating space to welcome audiences. Um, this is a juxtaposition arts also in Minneapolis in a very um, uh, low income, troubled neighborhood. These are the kids that they work with both on their mural and graffiti art, but also teaching them still life and real fine art skills. It's just an amazing organization run by two young African American, um, a couple. This is one of my favorite photographs. Again, I'm just really sad that they don't show up that well. This is all the site. This is the High Point Center for Printmaking also in Minneapolis, one of our artist centers. You can just see how this photograph shows the vibrancy of what's happening here, the gallery showing inside of one of their, you know, um, featured printmakers working with their master printer, the, the open door, the windows, the people moving inside, in and out, the, the bicycles. Again, trying to really, we have too many of our photos that we do use are just of artwork or of artistic spaces with nobody in them. I have lots of those. Um, pardon? Thank you. I only have, I think, three more slides. So, this is a, an art space project in Duluth, which is an old school building. This is what it looks at like as an artist studio today. So again, trying to show space and different things. This is a, uh, Jonathan Thunder's work in the middle, a young Ojibwa artist. And this picture, you can hardly see it, but the postures of these young women looking at this artwork. This is at a, an annual show of high school students work from all over the upper Midwest that this one woman puts together along with professional native artists showing in the next room their work is for sale, and then they all have an afternoon together, these young isolated art students, native art students with their artist uh, mentors. And even a frumpy old white guy mentor, a, a Midwesterner, can create a lot, a lot of jobs. These in the nonprofit sector, this is Garrison Keillor performing in our state theater in Minneapolis. And finally, M.C. Rye, a young Tunisian who brought his native folk art form, Rye, a form of music, to the Bay Area and L.A., then L.A., he moved there, uh, and, uh, you know, merged it with all kinds of other musical forms. And I love this slide more than almost any of them because it shows this enormous energy and relationship between the audience and um, the music makers. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's such a delight to have actually art integrated into the, into the format of a presentation uh, so we remember what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, Tom is going to, just to let you know, we're going to go right into Tom, uh, Tom's presentation. Just um, Ann Markson has actually done some work on rural creative economies as well. And um, 
Tom is, is kind of pinch hitting for a colleague from another federal agency, uh, Tim Wojohn, who couldn't be here today, but he's done a lot of very interesting work uh, kind of responding to Richard Florida's creative economy work. So this kind of extends, hopefully, what we were talking about in terms of looking at different sectors, different industries, that, and how they fall might be classified within what we're calling uh, collectively some kind of creative economy. Uh, this is in the rural sector. We, we just have five slides. So those are the two exceptions, if people were wondering. Uh, and and uh, Tom, so he's got five minutes. Thanks. Yes, this is very much a uh, mini presentation. Um, we thought it was such a perfect match to Ann's uh, that we weren't dissuaded uh, by the fact that he couldn't be here, has to be in San Francisco, that we were going to present it anyway. So I am very much subbing. Uh, one quick item I want to draw to your attention is uh, hopefully all of you have seen this sources of national occupational data sheet that we passed around just a few minutes ago. Uh, the reason I mention that is for many people uh, who, are, who are in the arts and maybe not so much in research, probably maybe not sure what ACS, CPS, OES, SOC mean. This is an opportunity to sort of catch up on your, your alphabet soup here for, for Washington. And, and I will all in, also introduce the very last one, which is the, the ONET, which is one other uh, way to look at occupational classification. As I say, this is uh, uh, highlights from the uh, creative class, A Key to Rural Growth, um, Tim Wojohn and Dave uh, McGranahan, and it's, there are copies of that in, in the back of the room so you can get the, uh, the actual article if you want to look at it in more detail. We've already had an allusion to Richard Florida, which, as many of you know, produced a book called The Rise of the Creative Class, in which you discuss the importance of the creative class. You need people involved in highly creative occupations and their importance to the economy. The USDA economists, uh, Tim Wojohn and Mr. Grantham, uh, use the ONET, which is a Bureau of Labor Statistics data set on skills generally used in the workplace to identify jobs in Florida's list that typically involve creative thinking. As Ann pointed out earlier, uh, Richard Florida's work showed a very large, or 52% of the labor force being part of the creative class. And a lot of people have worked to refine that, and you saw some of the measures that Ann and Greg Wassel and others have used to see what the size, how it goes down quite a bit when you begin to refine it. This is a little different way to refine it, and we found it very interesting. Uh, he screened out occupations requiring high levels of creativity, but whose numbers are proportional to the residential population served. For example, school teachers, judges, doctors, even though they obviously have high education levels, which was the primary measure that Richard Florida used. This is a table which um, is a little messy to read. This is loaded. Uh, again, you'll see occupational codes in the right-hand column, some of which you saw in, in Ann's prior slides. And you'll see there are a whole host of occupations they included from a variety of different um, sectors. And you'll notice that the arts occupations are asterisks uh, or by those occupations, and there's just a, a few of them listed there. To give you some idea, just as Ann said, it's only 2% of the labor force as compared to 52% when you use the, the full Florida definition. The creative class is predominantly urban. In both 1990 and 2000, two-thirds of the creative class counties were metropolitan. Creative class counties are those ranking in the top quarter of the proportion of residents employed in creative class occupations. About 11% of non-metro counties ranked as creative, cl creative class counties. Counties high in natural amenities are most likely to be creative class magnets. Pitkin County in Colorado, for example, which contains Aspen, had the largest creative class proportion of all non-metro counties in 1990 and 2000. Counties dominated by colleges and universities are also high in creative class proportions. And Again, I may not be doing justice to all of the aspects of his work, but just for this particular article, I think these are important. The creative class was highly associated with growth in rural areas from 1990 to 2004. Over non-metro counties, other non-metro counties grew relatively slowly in the 1990s, but creative class non-metro counties gained jobs over the period at a faster rate than their metro counterparts. Despite an urban affinity, the creative class can be drawn out of cities to high amenity rural locations. Their activities, in turn, appear to generate new jobs and local growth. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.
Um, if you could just hold on uh, to questions. We'll have questions right after um, one more presentation. Uh, this one, again, we're very glad to have you here, Jennifer, uh, to talk a little bit about a new survey. And this was, again, part of the reason why we wanted this convening, because uh, the survey is essentially replacing uh, sort of the decennial census data that we used to rely on uh, at very long intervals, 10 years, uh, to look at uh, artist occupations. And so now we'll, we'll be getting that data on an annual basis uh, through this new survey. Um, you've handed, and, and also, um, I believe uh, Sarah or somebody, yeah, great. Uh, a call, um, we're passing out copies of, a, of the questionnaire so you can actually see it, um, as well as was there something else? I think. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the American Community Survey. Um, thank you. Make sure you can hear me. The ACS is a continuous survey that provides estimates every year. Uh, it's one component of the re-engineered decennial census and is designed to address the nation's need for more current information on the characteristics of population and housing. If you recall, the 2000 decennial census included two forms, a long form and a short form. Uh, the short form had a few basic questions and there was more detail on the long form. Mo most housing units received a short form, but about 17% or one in six received the, short form, the long form. New for the 2010 census, all households will only receive the short form, um, collecting the most basic demographic and housing information. And the detailed demographic, social, economic, and uh, housing data previously collected in the long form will no longer be collected with the decennial census. Instead, it will be collected in the American Community Survey. In 2005, the ACS started full implementation, providing data similar to that of the census long form. It provides current, timely data that we now, we now get every year instead of once a decade. So why use the American Community Survey to study artists? Well, basically it shows where artists uh, fall in the portrait of America. It's the largest survey in the United States with about three million households, household addresses each year. Data from the ACS offers several advantages compared with other sources of occupations such as employer-based surveys and administrative records. The ACS lets people tell us what they do rather than asking employers for a list of job titles. The ACS captures people who are self-employed and unpaid family workers who are not usually covered in employer-based collections. And the ACS captures people who are not working. Data from the ACS also has several advantages compared with the CPS and household surveys because of its ma massive sample size. It offers extensive geographic detail. It offers extensive variable detail. For instance, it can reveal the 505 occupations that the Census Bureau collects, uh, including the artist occupations. And it offers an extensively, extensive ability to provide cross-tabulations of multiple categories. Um, and it offers the capability to measure these changes over time. So how does the ACS uh, identify artists? This is, um, as in your questionnaire, you can see it on page 11, I think. Um, the, the, um, you can see here two occupation questions the ACS uses to identify artists. The instructions show on the left say to list your primary occupation where you spend the most hours. If you are not currently working but have worked in the last five years, we ask you to list your occupation. In other words, the ACS can identify artists who may be retired or not currently working. Questions 45 and 46 um, are write-ins. 45 asks what kind of work was the person doing, or what, and which can be answered with either the occupation name or the job title. Question 46 asks what this person's most important activities were. These answers are provided to specially trained census coders in the Census Bureau's Jeffersonville, Indiana facility who then determine a person's occupation using the write-in responses along with the employer's name and industry and the respondent's age, sex, and educational attainment. The ACS, just like the census long form, provides many levels of geography from national levels, levels all the way down to the uh, census block groups. As shown here, we have three kinds of estimates from the ACS, the one year, the three year, and the five year. The one year estimate is made up of data collected over 12 calendar months. The three year is over 36 months, and the five year is over 60 months. As the number of years and months increases, the sample size is larger. And consequently, the estimates become stronger and can be displayed for smaller and smaller geographies. 
The content is derived from that of the decennial census long form. We collect data on a broad range of topics, demographic, economic, social, housing, and financial characteristics. The multi-year files, that is the three and five year files, provide sufficient sample to perform detailed analysis on specific artists, occupation, and industries. We have two standard data product types. The pre-computed tables, which appear in the Census Bureau's American Fact Finder, which, by the way, has only three tables right now displaying 505 occupations that include artists. And then a public version of microdata, the POMS file, which many people have been using, um, are most useful for those who need to create tables that are not available through the Census Bureau's American Fact Finder. For people who need the power of the entire data set, we also do special tabulations. This chart shows the data products release schedule. If you notice, for 2009, we released the one-year and the three-year estimates. Starting next year in 2010 and every year thereafter, we will be releasing a one-year, a three-year, and five-year estimates. This uh, slide shows a good illustration of multi-year estimates and data quality as shown here. One of the first analyses we created from this year's three-year file is a special tabulation on detailed earnings by uh, median, it's detailed occupation, excuse me, by median earnings for full-time year-round employees. Here we see two of the findings, the percent of women in each occupation and the women's to men's earnings ratio. I selected out just the artist occupations, as you've mentioned in your Artists in the Labor Force publication. Notice the artist occupation for the largest percentage of women here is dancers and choreographers. And remember, this is year-round full-time workers. And that's at 79%, meaning that four-fifths of the artists in this occupation are women and one-fifth are men. At the end of the blue bar, notice the whiskers representing the margin of error. They signify, they signify the sample variance around the estimate. In other words, if we did another sample, we would expect the estimate to fall somewhere in this range 90% of the time. That gives us an idea of how good this estimate is. In this case, the plus or minus of the margin of error is a rather small, around 5%. So we'd expect the estimate to fall between 74 and 84 most of the time. Looking at the same line on the right graphic, you see the point estimate of women's earnings to men's earnings is 79. But look at the variance. It's much larger, at 20%. In fact, if you compare this ratio to those down the page, you cannot distinguish whether this ratio for dancers and choreographers is different than that of other occupations. So, um, so what's new with the ACS? The purpose of the ACS is to be timely and current, which means producing timely products, for example, the EEO special tab, keeping current with changing definitions such as the SOC, and adding and changing and dropping content as required. The field of degree questions and labor force participations are good examples of this. Let me elaborate. The EEO tab is a special tabulation built for the specific purpose at the request of four federal agencies, but will support other analyses such as studying artists. The new file will have essentially the same occupation geographic content as the previous file. However, some, several things are new this time. It uses the ACS 2006 to 2010 five-year file. It will add a new variable, citizenship, in addition to the ones that we've had before. It will have, be based on the 2010 geographies, the 2010 population base, and the 2010 SOC occupation categories. We expect it to be available in the fall of 2012. The SOC, as we mentioned earlier today, is the standard occupation classification system used by all federal agencies. It was last updated in 2000 uh, for the 2000 census. We are in the process of updating again for 2010. And the new SOC will contain the same four-tiered level system that we've had in the past and the same 23 major groups. Overall, there are no substantive dip changes for 90% for of the detailed occupations, and there are none for the artist occupations that you feature in your reports. These occupations with significant changes and additions include information technology, healthcare, printing, and human resources. One of the more exciting uh, new content items for 2009 is the addition of the question on field of degree. This question was added due to a need by the National Science Foundation, who used the ACS for a sample design for their survey the National Survey of Recent College Graduates. Um, the field of degree question shown here asks respondents to write in their major field for their bachelor's degree. People with advanced degrees are only asked about their bachelor's degree, not the field of their higher degrees. 
Similar to the processing we have for the occupation data, these answers are then coded to a standard list by our staff in Jeffersonville. The standard list is based on the CIP SIP classification of institutional programs and the NSF classification systems. Shown here is just a partial list of the measures our coders are using to classify the write-ins. These may or may not all be shown in the POMS, depending on the disclosure avoidance rules that we have at the Bureau. The products based on this question are still in the developmental stage, and we will have something on the POMS showing up to two codes, and we will show certainly some basic distributions in our standard products. This question provides a great opportunity to discover where people were trained in the arts during college have found employment. They also may reveal occupation industries employing artists that we have not thought to consider before. In 2008, the Census Bureau implemented a few changes to the ACS questionnaire based on results of the content test in 2006. Two of the modifications were questions designed to measure labor force participation. Up to this point, the ACS and the 2000 decennial census consistently underestimated employment and overstated unemployment as compared to the official employment numbers from CPS. Our analysis of the estimates from the new ACS questions in 2008 finds that they are more consistent with those of CPS. Unfortunately, this question change coincided with the economic downturn of historic proportions. It is difficult to decouple the two effects in the data. This means year-to-year comparisons of employment should be considered with caution as they underestimate the change in the economic situation during the past year in the ACS. The ACS is an emerging data source for studying artists. It is a very large and dynamic data source and provides lots of analytic opportunity for examining artists and occupations and industries. Its strength lies in its timeliness and ability to capture small population subgroups. The ACS delivers useful, relevant data similar to data from previous census long forms, but instead we capture it every year, not just every 10 years. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Maybe now it's appropriate to actually give a round of applause to all our presenters. Great. Okay, so now, you know, we obviously heard a lot. Who would like to start the first question? We have a good long stretch here until about, I believe, 2.50, and I'm really hoping we can hear from the audience as well as people around the room based on a lot of the things you just now heard this last session. Bill, in the back, could you identify yourself? Phil Katz, American Association of Museums. I'm going to focus on a number that I know the most about, which is the number in the first slide that Ann showed with all the various parts of the cultural workforce, and I'm going to fixate on the number about museums workers that are in there, which is wildly inadequate and wrong in at least three ways, and maybe it suggests ways that all of the other numbers need to be looked at a little more critically. First of all, just on its face compared to everything else we know about our field, a number of 35,000 people who are defined as archivists, curators, and museum technicians is an undercount and is wrong, and we can get into technical reasons why others aren't captured. It doesn't capture a variety of other core professional activities at our institutions. For example, museum educators, talking about sort of a hybrid activity, aren't captured in that slice of museum professionals, so not all activities are counted. Messy around the edges, and this gets to what we consider cultural workforce and not cultural workforce. That number, even if we just look at people with those fairly narrow technical role in museums, art museum people all count in there, but people who do comparable work in zoos and aquariums, which we consider part of museums and consider part of culture, aren't counted there as well. Pushing it a little more, if we think about what are the limits of the cultural workforce as a whole, if we look at all people who are paid to work in museums in this country, the number is not 35,000. It's an order of magnitude higher. My estimate, based on some things in ACS, suggests 
400,000 plus, but that would include sort of everyone who works in a museum from, you know, the director of the Met to the person who picks up the garbage at the local historical society. And are we going to say that one of those people is part of the cultural workforce and one of them isn't? So just some sense of why I think that number is wrong with some suggestions of why we need to think all around the edges for all these numbers. Well, that's a very welcome intervention. And it reminds me that Judy Lee Reed and I have been talking for a year or more about similar responses to the counts that we get from the census. I'm thinking about, you know, the city of Chicago, for instance, the woman who runs their artist program said, I think we have three times as many artists as the ones we list. One thing I want to clarify for you is that these numbers are for occupations, and they're just narrowly for the curator occupation. We have data. It's in Greg and my article, and also they have done a very, very careful accounting in their cultural industry work in New England for the cultural industry. So we can get the same, we can get the number, and we have the number for the museum, zoo, et cetera, sector. And you would see much larger numbers there. But as you point out, they include everybody in the whole institution. I think using both is a very powerful way to go, which is one of the reasons why I was trying to show from the occupational side how it maps onto the industry side. But there's no question about it. And that really, again, underscores the point that Howard Becker makes in his book about our world, that we think of the individual artists and what they do. But really, for that individual artist to be able to make their work, you know, learn what they need for it, get all the inputs, et cetera, it's much bigger. One thing I'd really like to recommend to everybody is Bill Byer's wonderful study done in two rounds for the city of Seattle on the music industry. Just the graphic in there is amazing because it shows all of the different parts of the music industry, starting with who teaches music, who makes instruments, who repairs them, who produces the equipment for recording, and maps that out for the whole Seattle economy. And in Seattle, they actually have an office of film and music, and they celebrate the music industry in Seattle defined in this very broad way. I think you can get it on the Office of Film and Music website for the city of Seattle. Just to add on to what Ann said, what Doug DiNatale and I did is we created one set of estimates for the cultural labor force, more broadly defined than the NEA 11 artists, and another set of estimates for all employees of organizations that we defined as cultural. And they included many in the profit sector as well as the not-for-profit sector. The second number is larger. The interesting question that we couldn't answer because the second data source was the economic census and the first data source was the population census, how many of the artists identified in the population work for these other organizations? My rough guess is probably no more than half, especially since a lot of artists are self-employed. And I'll just say that's why the one table I put up, which is drawn for the census, enables us to do that because artists are, you know, allocated to these occupational and industry categories. So you can actually map that out, including they show the extent to which you're self-employed and work in those different industries. So it is possible to do with a lot of sweat. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Over there. I'm curious. This is Ian Moss. Since we've had some discussion about the census and various different federal data sources for artists, I'm curious if anybody knows about or can speak to the ways that other countries collect information about their artists. And is there anything that maybe we can learn from that? Have they set it up and have they used different strategies for either collecting or analyzing the information? That's an excellent question. I wish I could speak authoritatively to it. But does anyone else have any insights to offer, suggestions? Have you been following that? I believe that there's a lot of great work in the U.K. And just recently somebody told me about websites for them and also probably Canada. And, you know, I could probably get you the names of people who've done those kinds of studies. I'm sure they've been done for the U.K. and maybe other European countries too. I don't know. Australia, perhaps. Yes, Australia. Yes, David Thrasby's work on Australia. Good point. 
Yes, Holly. And could you talk a little bit about what you've seen uh, downstream from your research, how communities that you've studied have actually used any of the, um, oh. the material that you've generated and what you think yeah. the implications of uh, research to practice are? Wow, well, I think everybody who is a researcher room could say a lot about that, so I welcome other people to do that. First of all, I did pass around the link guide, um, the link guide to the data sets we, we created. This was really grueling work, thank God, for graduate students. We created data sets for all the link communities from the census data, um, all the socioeconomic data on artists, and, put, and we put it in comparative framework. And we did it, I don't know, for six or seven or eight states and about 18 different metropolitan areas. And um, we delivered it to them. We had phone conversations with them. We encouraged them to use it. And in the guide itself, we have about seven or eight instances of how people use the data right in there. Again, to encourage, because when we had presented it to the group as a whole, we really encouraged them to use it. So, and I, 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 I know that many people have come back to me and said they've used it in different ways since then. But those are some of the examples, including for the Washington State and uh, artists health insurance project and many other things um, uh, many many of the things I've done and uh, things other people have done I think maybe Greg could really speak to the intersection between their work and the creative economy work in New England which I think is the most advanced in the country at a regional level and a state level now there's a new creative industries unit in the state government in Massachusetts isn't that right so um, we're really making some inroads there. And I would just say in general, I just get so many requests from people, not only in the communities where we've done work, but in other communities for this data, for me to come and give talks on this data, um, for me to come in and work with them on their trying to present. This is particularly to present to city governments and state governments and for coalition building around some of these issues for programs for artists and in general to make the case for the arts. Um, Randy? Yeah, I would just follow up because I, I'm usually, uh, you know, a few months behind uh, Anne's speaking tour. Um, now I go to a lot of the places you go, and they, number one, they talk about what a fabulous, you know, research and tool it is, but how it uses research to galvanize um, a very broad sectors of the community together to have a conversation about the value of the arts, culture, as it relates to the economy, as it relates to planning, um, employment, and everything. So um, I think one of the really important pieces, as you just mentioned it briefly, is how it, uh, it it's really served as a, a great tool to um, build a very inclusive conversation as people look ahead to what they want the communities to look like. So I think that's a great benefit. So good work. I want to say, too, that I, I just... When I first started presenting this work publicly, the overwhelming response of artists and people who had arts organizations is, thank you for putting us in numbers. Thank you for enabling us to see ourselves and to see ourselves in comparison to the rest of the workforce and other places. And I was kind of blown away by that because I just didn't necessarily, this is the stuff I've been doing all my life for different occupations. I had no idea that, that people would find it that meaningful. And now I'm trying to use photography in a similar way to try to also, because I, and if anybody wants to talk about that and has experience, I really believe that photographs, um, and they're not that easy to produce in the way you want to, and they take a lot of work to get them the right way and to format them to tell the message that you want to tell, but I think we should use, we should use, this is what we have, we have artists, we should use artistic ways of, of even doing research. I believe that there's a lot of research data in the photographs that I use, but also as a way of communicating about it. Can I ask you also, Anne, do you know, is iconography, I mean, is that used, in, in terms of photos, has that been used in other kinds of research, maybe not about artists, but to what extent has photography been used kind of in documenting, you know, research findings? Have you seen that in other kinds of studies or... Anybody? <laughs> I don't Somebody must know. I, that's over my head. I just only. It's a really enticing possibility. It's dawning on yeah. me now. But right. uh, I think so. I think if you look, you know, one comparison I always make because I worked so long in scientists and engineers and, and worked with the AAAS, you know, the, the images and the information that's put out there about scientists and engineers is stunning in our society. If you listen to public radio, you know, every, every week there's several article, you know, pieces done that explore the scientist and his or her work and so on and so forth. And there are lots and lots of images. 
I think, you know, the science, AAAS as an organization of scientists and the National Science Foundation is doing a tremendous amount of communicative work about the meaning of science and scientists and engineers for the society, and I think they use photography a lot. I thought I saw a hand go up. Yes, Stephen. For those of you who have worked with the decennial census or the American Community Survey or the Census of Industries, I guess my question is if we came to a collective definition of what we thought a creative worker was, what would be missing? If we use these three data sources primarily, what are we not capturing? Which kinds of creative workers would not be counted? Or are they in other categories that we could find them through these data sources? But what are the deficiencies of those data sources for measuring and tracking the creative workforce over time? That's a great question, David. I'd like to go back to the comment of the gentleman in regard to museums. And that is I think that a lot of the question of what is missing depends on what you're looking for. In this sense, we talk about performing artists. Performing artists who have been around actors will tell you they are part very much of an ensemble effort that includes carpenters, electricians, lighting technicians, costumers, and so on and so forth. And this is something in the coalition of unions that the Department for Professional Employees represents. The stage employees are a major force. The industry doesn't exist on stage or on television or on film without those folks. It's an ensemble effort. And I think it goes back to the point about someone has to pick up the garbage from the local museum. But it's not just about picking up garbage. These are highly skilled creative people who might not be considered artists. And yet if you think about it, I saw a wonderful DVD about the making of Angels and Demons. They employed something like 83 highly talented sculptors as they recreated the Vatican, right? And painters, fine arts workers. They might not be captured as artists. It sounds like they could be captured. That is, they identify their sector. So if we were taking a slice that way, we could. I'm curious about what we can't get. Asking about what we can't get or what we don't want to get. I want to make sure I understand. Well, I think that's a really serious question. I think some of the things we can't get have come out earlier today. I think this question of hybrid artists, for instance. In our crossover survey, two-thirds of the artists responding said they had two art forms. You know, we put them in one box or another. This was stunning to us that they worked across artistic disciplines. So that's one set of things. Also, just in general, what we really need, you know, for our entire cultural enterprise in this country is, you know, a diminishing of the space between the supposed non-artists and artists. And none of this data enables us to do this. This data is basically data on workforce, on people who do this for their work. There are so many other artists who are doing artwork, but it's not, you know, it's not their major occupation. There are, there's this whole participatory arts movement, which is really being implemented in policy some places. The, you know, the, what is it called? The live arts thing in Los Angeles, the thing that the music center is doing where they're, the active arts, thank you, where Josephine Ramirez has created this amazing program where, for instance, people are invited to come together to pick up their high school instruments and play them together. And some performing groups have come out of this, like a group called Highfalutin. Just, there are a lot of really important issues for us as a community that we can't solve with these, you know, databases, secondary databases of artists. We also do a lot of interviewing. Lots of other people in this room have done interviewing. It's another way of really finding out. But again, most of those interviews are pretty much confined to, you know, a focus on artists 
and not so much on the relationship between, you know, a larger community and artists. I think related to that, it begs the question of at what point do people who are doing the kind of work that I think we're interested in stop calling themselves artists? And that has to do with how the work is validated to some extent within the arts field. So, for example, in New Orleans a few weeks ago, there's a particular program there that is about, it's an artist-led program that is environmentally focused, and it's about returning native plants to the area. And it's done through a collective of artists. If you talk to them, they're hesitant about whether they want to call themselves artists anymore. So one guy told me, I guess you could call me a curator, but I'm kind of the groundskeeper. So there's this identity issue that becomes problematic, and I think Nick alluded to it, with the teaching artist identity. So I think those are some of the, you can get back to the hybrid stuff too, but those are, I'm curious about the self-definition in the ACS and how much control there really is, if any, over that, and how much of it comes, how much of an awareness or self-awareness might be cultivated within the sector, within the art sector, in ways that to some extent maybe aren't encouraged now. As far as the ACS, it's just like the Sennial Census, and similar to the current population survey. It's a household survey, so we, in the case of the ACS, we hand them a form, or in the current population survey, we actually have a field rep out there, and we ask them what their major job duties are. And so it really is a self-identification, and it's sort of what your mood is that day, the way you're going to answer it. And then we try to take that, and we have our definitions, and try to take what you said and park it into what's closest. And it really depends on what the person tells us. I've been thinking about the question about, you know, who the numbers aren't capturing. And the work that I've been doing with my colleague, Carol Gill, at the University of Illinois Chicago, we did a three-year qualitative study for the NEA on barriers and facilitators to arts careers for people with disabilities. And one of the things that we found is that the systemic oppression and discrimination against people with disabilities from the earliest education and training programs through professionalization, through their careers, is so extensive that it's difficult for the people who are out there doing arts work to be connected to any of the organizations in which people find research participants. And the other thing is that there's a section in our community of people who live on Social Security and Social Security disability income. And for those artists to report income from the arts can jeopardize their eligibility for those benefits. And if they report their incomes and they can lose their benefits, they can lose their health insurance, they can lose their personal assistance. So there's an income threshold over which you basically have to leap over to make enough money or to be affiliated with an institution so that you can get those things that you need to survive. But then, you know, so all the people in the middle get left out. So there are people out there who are doing arts work, calling themselves artists, working in the arts, working a lot with communities, doing volunteer work, but who kind of hide because they don't, you know, we got a lot of information because, you know, both Carol and I have disabilities. People trusted us to tell us their stories. A lot of people are working, getting paid under the table, going through all kinds of strategies so that they, it's paradoxical because you want public attention, but you have to also hide at the same time that you're doing your work. So I think that without understanding and having information on the barriers that people are facing to even entering the arts as a career, then we don't understand what's keeping them out and what kind of actual work they're doing. Does that make sense? I'm glad that you're speaking. You had a question, Joan. I just thought that one thing that's very useful is 
I know that uh, Carrie's doing work also on qu uh, quantitative, rather your colleague is Carol Gill, also Dr. Gill, on, on quantifying some of the data to back up the qualitative data you found through the, uh, through the case studies of these, these artists in these communities. And I think, um, I mean, it's going to drive on uh, respondent-driven sampling, which of course, um, you're seated right next to Joan, who's <laughs> my, yeah, sort of a pioneer of that. Uh, I actually I have two things. One is in relation to Maria, because my question is not when you stop calling yourself an artist, but when you start calling yourself an artist. Um, but the other thing I think Stephen's question is very appropriate about if we put all these data sets together, what, what's missing? I think one of the things that's missing that we haven't done a very good job on is the relationship of artists' work to their other work. Um, not always assuming they're only waiting to do their artwork full time. Uh, there are some very synergistic relationships. I mean, if you're a uh, ceramicist, you do like having the kiln at the place where you teach. There are reasons that actors are waiters so that they can leave their job and go on tour. This is very different for different kinds of artists. And I think we've kind of broad brushed that, um, assuming that you know all artists should be working full time as artists when actually there are other pieces of their lives which help integrate them into society and which we don't know enough about. Um, I thought of it, I, I could think of a million things, but there's just a couple other things that I thought I'd bring to your attention when you're trying to count people with disabilities in these um, surveys or in statistics, and this is something that Carol and I are, are grappling with, is that a lot of the ways in which we ask for information might not be accessible to certain people with disabilities. So for instance, there could be, um, if we're using technology, there may be difficulties for people who are blind or who use screen readers to, to use the online technology, or it can be so cumbersome, or they may be so overwhelmed by information, they have to be choosy about um, what they interact with. Or um, some people who use American Sign Language as a primary means of communication might not be able to communicate in a qualitative study without maybe the use of vlogs, you know, or um, visual communication. There's also problems of economic access to technology. So when I hear, um, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff online now, but some people don't have um, access to online survey instruments. Um, and then, but then I, I, I was distressed to hear about this postcard, whoever sent out the postcard to get people to respond in written forms too, um, or people who also have speech disabilities um, in doing interviews. So there's lots of those kind of uh, barriers to, to keep in mind when we're trying to reach populations for whom those kind of instruments might not be, you know, literally accessible. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, anyone in the audience? I'd love to hear from some people. Oh, Carlos. Oh, and then Susan. Thank you. Hi. I'm oh, Carlos Manjarres uh, from IMLS. One of the things that I'm concerned with, um, with uh, industry classifications, particularly when we're talking about fields that don't have very formalized uh, credentialing systems, is the extent to which um, these classifications are really robust enough, or on the other hand, whether or not they provide certain artificial uh, categories that are not really so meaningful over time um, and so I guess my concern really is that um, that could have a really big impact on whether or not change over time the trend analysis is, is um, you know, is something that uh, we really should put a lot of stock in, particularly in fields um, where, where the nature of work has changed so significantly over time. Um, but the other thing I think that uh, the real advance, one of the big advances of the American Community Survey is where you're categorizing work um, and then identifying your most active work is, is an important advance. However, there's the possibility that in the coding, I've forgotten where it's done, Indiana or some, somewhere, wherever it's done in the Midwest, um, it's, it's entirely possible that we're coding back to our industry classifications and our, and, our, and our employment codes that, are, that exist already. So, so while we have rich um, respondent-supplied information 
that, as we all know, could be coded in any number of ways. We could be replicating uh, classifications that might not be so hot to begin with. Um, and so I guess one of the questions I have is, um, has to do with basically the guidance for coding uh, uh, the ACS responses and whether or not there are, um, you know, folks looking at uh, the data maybe with a different lens, not trying to push it into existing classifications, uh, employment classifications, but, um, you know, playing around with, with alternative coding schemes. Uh, we, the coding's done in Jeffersonville, Indiana, so yes, you were correct. Um, and it's both the uh, occupation and industry classification. We code many other things there also. And we have a staff that is dedicated to just that, um, class, to the, just that coding operation. Um, they code both the current population survey, the ACS, and, any, and other um, household uh, surveys that require coding for occupation and industry. The, as I mentioned earlier, the occupation comes from the SOC, the Standard Occupation Classification, which we do update every 10 years so that we can be current and that we are, um, uh, we, the committee is made up of people from uh, several agencies who work with occupations and are trying to very hard to make sure that we a, don't make changes just willy-nilly and that we um, are keeping up with what the current uh, um, workforce scheme is. The same thing is true with the industry. The industry classifications are on the NAICS, which is um, it, it's, it's updated every five years um, to coincide with the economic census of the Census Bureau. And from the NAICS, we then uh, take a subset of that to put on our household service, because the NAICS is a very long list of industries. And again, it would be very hard to capture on a household survey. Um, but those also are updated every five years to coincide with the economic census. Yeah. Okay. That doesn't really address the question. Right. I'd like to address the question. Actually. Okay, great. Um, uh, yes, it's really important for us to understand our categories. And these categories are, you know, fashioned, you know, through expertise, et cetera. I spent a considerable amount of time trying to understand the SOC codes um, in the big change order that happened in the 1990s, which made it so difficult for us to compare between 1990 and 2000. And, at the, and for the SOC changeover, there were actually a, a number of academics who were labor economists and others brought in in a series of meetings and who wrote papers about how we should change the SOC codes um, the way we should. I got those only by calling somebody at the Bureau of Labor Statistics who told me they existed. I, I didn't know that. And he actually found them and sent me copies. It was about a pile that long, high. The point of my telling that story is that, you know, we should be more proactive as a community in interacting with the census over these definitions. And if we have ideas about the ways in which they're imperfect and we would like to change them, you know, this would be, I, I assume that now would be a time to do it. So I don't know if anybody has the energy uh, 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 and excitement to do that, but I would later I'd like to ask a few more questions about the American Community <laughs> Survey that maybe other people would like to address. I that. think we have someone here from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, don't we? Uh, could you stand up, please? <laughs> Thanks. I'm Roger Monkars from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And Thank you for coming. There's no question that we, we want the public to be very involved in the SOC process. I, I, I specialize in IT occupations, and my expertise was tapped on, but we reached out. I reached out to contacts I have and encourage each of you. I think the email address is sock at bls.gov. You can start writing to them and telling them how you want classifications to change, how you want, how you want the occupations to kind of interact with each other. And like Jennifer mentioned, one, once they actually revise the SOC, there's, it, we put it out for public comment. We want the public to comment. Oftentimes, we don't get enough public comment. So very good point to be proactive, reach out. We'll try to reach out to you as much as possible, but there's only so much we can do because obviously it is a huge undertaking to revise a 850 occup occupation classification. So thank you for coming, uh, Roger. Yeah. Uh, 
I'd just like to reflect. Earlier I gave my card to Ms. Day and asked if I could be added to a list. I'd like to suggest that having a list that notifies when these deliberations are about to occur would certainly be helpful for those of us who don't read the Federal Register page by page on a daily basis. It would be very helpful. Right. I think, Susan, do you still have a question or comment? Does someone have a mic? We'll give you a mic. Susan Seifert, University of Pennsylvania. I guess it's on the topic of what's missing. I have two things I was thinking about that in some ways we're talking occupation and industry. I feel like there are a couple of conversations. One's occupation and industry, and another is workforce. The title of the forum was workforce, but that's actually the topic we're not addressing. And it's something that I'm not that familiar with, but I think the Howard Becker, some of the comments about the museum categories and Howard Becker, the art world, the artist inside the art world, is starting to think about the cultural workforce in addition to the artist as the context for the artist. And that when someone had asked about international work, I mean, just a cursory look, I do feel like the United Kingdom, Canada is, I think this also circles back to the question, why research, why are we doing this, Joan asked. And I guess one question is if we're looking at policy around workforce, the U.K. national agencies are actually looking at workforce. What's the music industry in there? What's the museum industry? What's the library industry? They're going down and asking what is every skill, they're inventorying skills, they're inventorying occupations and titles and putting them by geographic part of the country and saying who's got people, you know, and they have an inventory of unemployed or underemployed people in each geography, and they're matchmaking. Canada, certain provinces in Canada are doing the same thing. This is just a real quick cursory look, but I can't see anybody in the United States doing this. So that was one thought, and I'm just curious about if that's the direction this forum is interested in. So you're talking about sector by sector, or are you talking, I mean, skill set? What I'm talking about is are we interested in workforce development or in the cultural economy, whereas, in fact, really what we're talking about is the artist. You know, so, in fact, I think, you know, they're all valid. It's just that it's a different conversation and different kinds of data, and I think it connects to some of the questions raised. Could I just ask you to mention one other thing is I think that designer category that keeps growing in all these trends is maybe underdeveloped in terms of a missing piece, because I think there's a set of designers that are like the industrial designers. They're product, they're creative designers. It's the artisan category of productive designers. It's not the service-oriented designer like the interior designer or whatever. And I think in Philadelphia we're starting to inventory this and explore it. It's also graphic designers. Graphic, yes, but it's just I think it might be a little underdeveloped in terms of our data collection. Great. Could we go there and then back there? Thank you. This actually brings up just a great question, because I think for a slight person that loves data but is often confused about how my data is given to me, or like I like the number at the end, but when I start parsing out where it comes from or how it's gotten there, I'm confused. I think there is a really great need for somebody, and potentially the NEA could be a good place for this to begin, to do a data primer, to really say, here is census data. This looks at workforce occupations. Here's the upside of looking at these numbers for artists. Here's the downside. So we have workforce artists. Here's one thing. Then there's practicing artists. 
practicing artists go from a continuum from aspirational to paycheck artists, to workforce artists. Here's how they are captured in this kind of data. So that the average person could then also figure out, like almost like a map of data collection, which Joan, I think, in a certain sense, gave us in the beginning a little bit of the beginning too. But to give us a sense not only of what data is available, but how to read that data, but also then looking forward, if you have a challenge set, if you're a change agent and you want to make change, what kind of data could you suggest to a graduate student or one of Anne Smart students or just say, hey, let's look at this, and that if the industry could say, here are holes, mm -hmm. right? We know that we've got these covered. Here are holes as a directive, as a group. Here are holes for other people to cover. Then I think we'd also be giving direction in a larger sense to people coming up in the, the data ranks to really sort of parse out some of these finer distinctions. Great, thank you. Um, sorry, uh, Kelly? Thanks, Kelly Barstate again, National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. And I, um, I was watching this uh, television show on um, the universe last night on the Science Channel, and it was talking about dark matter, right? So um, there are all of these very exciting things out there in the cosmos. There are there are there are stars, there are planets, there are galaxies, but actually, unbeknownst to all of us down here. Um, there is a cosmic superstructure of dark matter, which is actually the stuff that holds the whole universe together, and scientists have no idea what it is. And, and I'm having it, that experience kind of translating <laughs> a little bit. I mean, the, um, we've been talking about some really important, um, you know, kind of celestial objects, right? Uh, we've been talking about the force part of workforce today. I think a lot um, uh, in terms of the number of people that are employed in certain occupations and how we can best aggregate those um, and how we can improve on our systems for, for tracking hours, earnings, things like that. And all of those are really important, but um, I guess I'm also very curious about the work part of that workforce phrase. Um, I think that some of the work um, that you're doing, Maria, some of the uh, link projects, some of the other smaller scale studies that are really unpacking as part of this workforce equation, not just what's the force, but what's the work? You know, what, um, not just what are artists earning, but how are they spending their time? And how are they spending their resources? Um, and what's happening? Um, when artists are doing work. Um, and uh, that just seems to me like more of an undiscovered country. And, um, you know, going to your great catalytic question, um, uh, Stephen, about, uh, about what's missing or what's deficient, I, I wondered if um, anybody had any ideas or comments or remarks on that. Uh, Ruby Eisler. Um, well, um, I come to research meetings and I always end up feeling really guilty because I feel that, you know, we're sitting on a potential gold mine of information that, you know, we aren't a research organization. So we, we're not really utilizing, I think, our, the, the opportunities that we have. So for instance, when we do a grant round, we have a public, um, uh, you know, uh, offering and 2,000 to 2,500 people apply every time we have a grant round. We could be asking certain questions, um, you know, that could come from a group like this that might extract certain data over, that could be tracked over time. Um, we're going back now to all 400 of the artists that we have supported over the last decade. Again, it's a subset, but I think probably a very interesting one. Um, particularly because there are so many hybrid artists um, in it. And I, I feel that everyone here should be able to contribute questions to that. We're going to do a big survey of our artists. So, um, so we have some opportunities, um, I think, in an ongoing way um, that really are underutilized. And I think um, Kelly could perhaps get at, in a deeper way, some of the, the questions that, that you're raising. Mary Jo. Um, well, I'll pick up on the workforce and the question about what's missing. And, and the questions about are we talking about occupations, sectors, whatever. And so what this, my area is actually economic competitiveness uh, before NGA and I run the economic development division there in workforce. So you have to know where I'm coming from. Um, uh, 
what this conversation reminds me of is two conversations that always happen in economic development. It starts with the good example is information technology. When we first figured out there was a whole new sector out there, information technology, it was all about, well, let's, the folks who worked in those businesses or that sector or that industry wanted numbers to show who they were and what they were doing. And that was great, and they really hung on to that until they figured out the next elevation up was actually, no, we're not really a separate sector. We're important to all sectors and all parts of the economy. And so then we had a more sophisticated analysis of the impact of IT on the economy. You're almost there, I think, in the hybrid analysis, but not quite. You haven't expanded it as broad as I think you should. Then the third level of IT conversation is, no, everybody has to have IT skills. And it means every profession going forward will demand knowledge of technology and be doing it so you forget this whole issue about, then it becomes a conversation about what skills do you need to have in order to be competitive in the 21st century. I think that's where your goal is, because if you really know what's going on out there and what governors and everybody else care about is, this, your best triangle to look at is tough times, tough choices. If you haven't seen Mark Tucker's work, he's got a triangle that looks like this, where work is going in the future. The bottom, most of the jobs in the bottom of that triangle are work that's done by machines or work that's routine and it's all going overseas. The top of the triangle is creative work, broadly defined, and the only hope of a developing country is to have as much work as they can in the creative part of this pyramid. And more and more what we need to be thinking about is, that's not about artists, it's about creativity, imagination, problem solving, design, all kinds of things. But the important thing is, those skills are gonna be important for every single sector that's gonna be stayed embedded in the United States, just about. There is also another group, which is what they call jobs or industries that require face-to-face. Nurses, they're not, you know, that's an occupation. I would argue they're also problem solvers. But they're, so the important thing is, I think, for what's missing, how do you constantly keep thinking in your mind, we want to elevate the analysis that we're doing because ultimately, in my point of view, from this country's competitiveness, is we have to get as so many people as we can to have that creativity, that imagination, and those skills that are gonna be required. I don't care where you work. It's gonna be important in almost any kind of thing that's gonna be important and lucrative going forward. Now, the folks who are probably gonna beat you to that conversation is the green conversation. Because they're going through the exact same thing. Who are we? What do we count? Is it about green, making green things, providing green services? Or is it about the sustainability officer inside of Corporation X and how are we counting that? My argument to them is yes, we need to understand all that. But ultimately, if we do this well, everybody will be thinking about sustainability in every one of their occupations. So what are the, what is the training and the kinds of support do we put in place so that one, in that case, everybody's thinking about sustainability and efficiency and productivity. In your case, what do we do to ensure that every single individual is using the creativity, imagination to their greatest extent possible? And I think that's kind of the way I would sort of encourage you to think about where are we on this track of understanding what's going on. On that hopeful note, we're gonna have to break, but I encourage you to keep that energy bottled up because we're gonna now roll up our sleeves and kind of move us into some direction, hopefully. Thanks. Thank you.